welcomes. Wow, these days so long anticipated are finally here. Welcome. You know, as Chris mentioned, we serve women who are pregnant, uh, but one of our convents is actually right next to a grade school. And every so often, the sisters are invited to go over and be with the children and have lunch and recess. And you should see us out there on the basketball courts, seriously. I mean, the hoops are like this high. Sisters are like slam dunking. I mean, it, it's like Jesus makes all your dreams come true. <laughs> and our favorite conversations are with the five-year-olds, mostly because they don't have a sensor of what might be appropriate or inappropriate to ask sister. So one day, a little girl looks at sister and she goes, so what's on your head? And it was like, dunk, 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 dunk. The eyes of all look to sister for the answer. She starts talking about brides and weddings. And she closes Ladies out by saying, you know, as a sister, I wear a veil because I'm married to Jesus. And this little girl slams her hands down and looks up and goes, he chose you. Thanks a lot, kid. You don't think I don't ask myself the same question every morning? Here's the wild thing, though. In your heart and in mine is a desire to be chosen. We want to be chosen. And Jesus chose you. And he orchestrated things so that you would be here this morning. He wanted you to know and experience that his waiting for you reached you. And he has new gifts and graces that he wants to bestow in abundance. You know, it can be rough out there, really difficult. Uh, we can end up carrying hidden burdens, you know, anxiety, depression, fear. But God drew you here, and he wants you to step in to this time of light and peace and grace. This morning, we're going to talk about the three necessary elements of true freedom. First, identity, who I am. Second, the ability to choose what I do. And third, vocation, how I'm called to live my love. So let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come. You are welcome here. Fill our hearts, fill our minds, open us to receive, open us to desire. Come through Mary. We praise you, Jesus, and we bless you, and we love you. Help us to know more deeply who we are, who you've called us to be. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit, amen. So St. Francis of Assisi was overheard in an empty chapel late one night, praying over and over again. Who are you, most sweet God, and who am I? These are the greatest questions of life. And here we are in Krakow, where John Paul II asked himself these questions and then posed them to the young adults he accompanied. We're in the land where St. Maximilian Kolbe and St. Faustina heard the answer to these questions. And just think, for those of you who courageously are willing to go into your heart with the Lord, you will hear your answer. The same God who set the bounds of the ocean, who placed the stars in their courses, the God who had a thought and it became the coral reefs, Niagara Falls, the Cliffs of Moher, who crafted the peacock, and the orangutan, and the giraffe. I mean, at a certain point, he was just having a ball up there. This God made you. This God made you. You know, once after Holy Communion, St. Faustino is saying to Jesus in her heart, I thought about you so many times last night. And he replied, I thought about you before I called you into being. And he says this to each of you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God thought of you, and you never left his mind. He's always thinking of you. He's thinking of you right now. He made you in his image and likeness, and this divine imprint in you 
is particular to you and was entrusted to you specifically. You know, fingerprints are a marvel to me. They identify you as totally unique, the only you who ever was and ever will be. Now, if God's going to take so much time designing and arranging the circles on the ends of our fingers, how much more the love of your heart? You are the only one who can love with the love of your heart. And you are the only one who can love God with the love of your heart. And he longs for it. Your life is a gift. You are a gift. Some of you might be thinking, um, you know, that's very nice, sister, for someone else, but not for me. I'm too much, or um, I'm not enough, never enough, or I'm too far gone. If this is what you're hearing, this is especially for you. You are a gift. I was telling a group of teens that they're sacred and precious. And one of the young men, he raised his hand, he's like, you know, sister, I don't like thinking about myself as precious because that's like, I don't know, tender and supple and it just makes me uncomfortable. And I was like, all right, first of all, you weren't made for comfort. Secondly, you can't help it. You're irreplaceable, you're irrepeatable. You're beyond price or you're invaluable. You're 17 years old and absolutely precious. Accept it. <laughs> it's true. And we need to be reminded that this is true. Because what the culture tells us is something very different. And they're, they're telling us something that is not true. You're not who they say you are. Is my identity the person featured on my Facebook page? Is it how others perceive me? So, my parents don't have any money. Or, I'm an athlete. Or, I'm dating this person. Or, I can't get a date. Or, I'm a straight-A student. Or, I'm failing every class miserably. Yeah, these things are part of life, but they change. They don't answer the question, who am I? Our sisters met a young man named Andy, and he worked for a church. And Andy had Down syndrome. Now, one of my sisters, she's always trying to get ahead in the spiritual life. She kind of picked up that Andy was an insider and could teach her a thing or two. So she goes, Andy, do you pray? Every day. Would you say you're close to God? Very close. Is he your best friend? Hmm. I have friends. This is different. It's more like we're one. He's in me, and I'm in him, and we're one. Andy knows the truth that sets us free. In baptism, you became one with Jesus. You belong. You're accepted. You're loved. You're not alone. God made you his own child, his own beloved daughter or beloved son. And this decision he made was not random and it wasn't accidental. It was completely intentional. This is who you are, beloved, forgiven, awaited. This never changes no matter what you do or what others do to you. You know when your favorite song comes on and you only have to hear like that beginning like guitar string and you're like, oh, oh it's my song. <laughs> and it's almost like when, the, when God inspired the artist to write it, he like secretly had you in mind alone. And the band was playing it earlier, you know, it comes on and you just feel like you need to lay down somewhere to like drink it in. Or if you're in the car, it's like windows down, volume up, <laughs> praise hand out. You know, for me, my, my latest is good, good father. Um, and it's a little awkward. Yeah, 
It's a little awkward to sing it to you without a guitar like Chris, but I'm a little awkward and I can't play the guitar. But I'm going to sing it to you anyway. Ready? <clears throat> <laughs> okay, don't look at me. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And then if I play the guitar, I'd be like, yeah, just totally. This would be the part where he like, takes off. It's true. This is true. You know, the catechism tells us no one is father as God is father. And we have a good father. He loves you. He is never too busy, never distracted, never burdened by your needs, your questions, your concerns, your desires. He makes all things work for the good even the pain inflicted on us by others who abuse their freedom and choose evil. This is the truth that sets us free. So the first element of freedom is identity. The second is the ability to choose. You know, we know of a survivor of the 9-11 terror attacks in New York City who was saying that after the first plane hit, he ran down into the subway to escape danger, and people flooded the subways. And while they were waiting for the train, one of the Twin Towers collapsed, and the entire subway tunnel was filled with the soot, pitch black darkness. Everyone was silent, shocked, stunned. Then a lone voice cried out, everyone follow me. It was the blind man who begged for food at that stop every day. Because he lived in darkness, he knew his way out in darkness. They all linked arms, formed a human chain, and the blind man led them out to safety. Now, he could have just saved himself easily, but the Holy Spirit inspired him to give what only he could give, and he chose the good of others. He chose love. God endowed men and women with freedom, and this distinguishes us entirely from the animals. The human person is able to reason and is responsible for the actions taken. We can recognize what is true, what is good, what is beautiful, and choose it. This gift reveals God's great love for us. It not only shows us that he respects us, but that he trusts us. Freedom was given us for the sake of love, that we might choose to love as we were created to love. And we all want to be loved. You know, it's deep in us. We want to be known. We want to be important. We want to be sought after, special. It's kind of like when you're single and you're getting ready to go out. You know, it takes forever to get ready. I don't know, guys, if it's like getting your hair to go in the right direction, but ladies, it takes hours, right? Sometimes you, you almost have to like re-shower just to get a clean canvas and start over. I mean, what's that all about? Even if I know everyone who's going to be it wherever I'm going, there's this little spark of hope that maybe someone new will be there. Someone unexpected. Someone who corresponds to all of my desires for love and affection. And I'll be on one side of the room laughing, and they'll see me laughing and be totally taken by my laughing. And it'll be this moment, and I'll be like, ah, gentlemen, I think you know what I'm describing here. We want to be noticed, we want to be chosen, and we're made in God's image. And that means God wants to be chosen too, freely, and he won't force us. And by this, he makes himself vulnerable to being ignored and rejected. We haven't always made choices that are good or beautiful, and on our own, we won't have the strength to. But we always have the choice to trust Jesus with our weakness. In this way, he can love us. He can lift us up. Going to confession relieves us of burdens we were never meant to carry. It gives us the strength to love with his own love. 
So the second element of true freedom is the ability to choose. And now the third, vocation. God creates, and he creates with a plan, with a purpose. That you exist means that God has a plan for your life. This we call vocation, and the word vocation means call. We don't create our own purpose. It's revealed to us. We discover it, and with our freedom, we choose to cooperate. When St. Faustina was 16 years old, she felt an attraction, a desire to enter religious life. And when others heard about this, including her parents, they told her, forget about it, put it away. They discouraged her, and so she tried to do just that. She distracted herself with the parties and the fashions of the world. At age 20, she decided to go to a dance with her sister Natalie. She was wearing a beautiful pink dress and had her hair all pulled back. And while she was on the dance floor, she suddenly saw Jesus approaching her, and he was covered in the wounds of his passion. She described it as everyone else disappearing, even the music. He asked a simple question of her, and it pierced her to the heart. How long will you put me off? She went straight to a local cathedral, and right there in front of the elderly church ladies of every parish, of every time and place, she laid prostrate in front of the tabernacle, and she asked Jesus to show her what to do. She entered the convent, became a sister of Our Lady of Mercy, and received the visions of Jesus' divine mercy. Now, brothers and sisters, can you imagine if she kept putting him off? Thank you, St. Faustina. Thank you for not wasting another minute on those things that pass away. Those things that distract us and dissuade us from becoming who we truly are, from our truest happiness and holiness. Thank you for that courageous yes that brought us directly into the heart of Jesus' merciful love. I love John Paul II's words, which are Jesus' words, do not be afraid. I know, I needed to hear them when I was discerning, when I was thinking about the possibility of religious life. I mean, all I could picture was the sound of music and sister act. It was all very confusing. <laughs> I didn't know how God would satisfy my desires for love, romantic, passionate, forever love. My desires for motherhood, to have my own litany of saints, you know, Peter, James, John, Paul, Thomas, Philip, Bartholomew, Linus. I was afraid, but when I drew close to him in prayer, I realized Jesus wasn't trying to take this away from me not these desires of my heart. He wanted to fulfill them. What is his invitation to you? I'll say this, we need holy, committed husbands who give themselves totally to their wives. We need fathers, good fathers, who work devotedly to provide, who are present to their children with love, discipline, affirmation, guidance. We need holy wives who will love and uphold their husbands. We need holy mothers who bear and nurture life, spreading their maternal tenderness as far as their eyes can see and their hands can reach. We need holy priests and religious brothers, men after Jesus' own heart, who give us Jesus in word and sacrament, men who love the church, who are full of integrity, who are spiritual fathers and like good shepherds are willing to swing their staff when the wolf comes too close to their flock. We need holy religious sisters and women consecrated to God who can say to Jesus,
who can say to Jesus, you are all mine and I am all yours, who are spiritual mothers available to all and say to every person, especially the most vulnerable, you are not alone. What will you do with your life? You are here for a reason. You know, the saints never blamed or accused God for the evil they saw around them. They knew he had called them to live at that time in history, to join his saving work. God chose you now. The family needs you. Society needs you. The church needs you. Others need you too. When you courageously say yes to what God has called you to, it sparks courage in others, and they can say yes. I want to tell you about Raquel, one of the mothers who came to live with us. You know, it wasn't easy for her, but with every yes she made, she was able to inspire others. Here's the story that she shared with us. She said, I was on an elevator in the hospital one day on the way to a doctor's appointment, and another woman got on. I said, hello. And she burst out crying and said, I'm pregnant. I said, congratulations, I'm pregnant too. She explained she just couldn't do it right now. It wasn't the right time. Raquel felt her baby move inside of her and took this woman's hand and put it right on her pregnant belly. And at that moment, baby kicked her. And she goes, whoa. And Raquel goes, yeah, my baby's going to be a football player. He's going to be strong, and he's going to be blessed. This woman said, why is he going to be blessed? Raquel answered, because he's here. Whether you cry or you laugh, if you're here, you're blessed. You're put here for a reason. She said, I'm going to get an abortion. Raquel said, no, you're not. You're going to have a girl. She said, I'm having a boy and that's okay. You have your girl, you dress her up in pink and you put ponytails in her hair. And call her Raquel. By the way, my middle name is Jasmine. If she ever asks you how she got her name, you just tell her you met a fabulous lady in the elevator one day who told you you were going to have a little girl. They laughed together, they got off the elevator, and Raquel walked her down to her OBGYN for an appointment. She was laughing, she said, see, I can be pushy. We asked her if they kept in touch, but she said, I didn't see her again until two years later at the same hospital. She was pushing a stroller and ran up to me and hugged me. She had twins, two girls, and their names were Raquel and Jasmine. She had them dressed up all in pink, just like I told her. She made it. She said to Raquel, I love you. You don't understand, Raquel. I love you, I love you, I love you. I will never forget your name, your face, your smile. I love you. I would do anything for you. And Raquel said, I love you too. I understand. I've experienced it. Your love can change the world. Rise above the paltry standard that has been ra raised for you. You're capable of greatness, of heroic virtue of stunning self-sacrifice. Yes, love is demanding if it's going to be real. And nothing is more worthy. Nothing is more rewarding. When John Paul II's mother passed away, when he was eight years old, his dad brought him to the shrine of Our Lady and placed him before her and said, this is your mother who will never leave you. She's our tender mother. She loves us deeply and intimately. She holds our hand. 
She crushes the serpent that strikes at our heel with her bare heel. Mary tells us the secret of her life. Do whatever he tells you. In these holy days, let your heart hear his voice and say yes. You will experience joy and the certainty of being loved now and into eternity. Let her walk with you these days. God bless you. Oh,